Immediately after the devastating and world-changing day that was September the 11th, 2001, the thought that the US government could be behind it was the last thing on people's minds. But as time went on, more and more questions were going unanswered, and before long, one in seven Americans started believing the US government had some involvement in the 9-11 attack. The trouble is, what and who can we believe? It's very easy to say one thing and make it sound believable, and although a lot of what the 9-11 truth seekers say is proof of an inside job, many say it isn't and cannot be used as evidence of the US's involvement. But there are, however, a few things that even those who believe the official story, that 19 devote Al-Qaeda terrorists were responsible, will say, okay, that doesn't really make sense. Now, before I begin, I want to say I am in no way supporting any of these claims whatsoever, or saying the government had any involvement. I will simply be giving forth the information that is out there, and the thoughts that the attack may have been a cover-up or could have been prevented. Again, I am not agreeing with what is being said, I am simply giving you the information so you can make up your own mind, and we'll be comparing the conspiracy theories with the official story in the 9-11 Commission report. Bear in mind that many people stick to a conclusion, and regardless of how much evidence there is suggesting it wasn't an inside job, people can always cling on to something to say proves it was, and vice versa. So keep this into consideration, and explore both sides thoroughly before making a decision, especially before preaching your decision on others. The biggest question surrounding that day is who was responsible for the attacks, and was it really the 19 Al-Qaeda terrorists that the media portrayed after 9-11? Let's look at some of the theories surrounding the thought that the people that were said to be responsible were not. For starters, four passports were found in total belonging to the supposed terrorists involved. Two were found at the Pennsylvania crash site of Flight 93. One was found in the luggage of a terrorist that did not make it onto the plane and was stuck on a conveyor belt in the airport. And one was handed to an FBI agent shortly after the first plane hit the North Tower that was found on the ground completely undamaged not far from the World Trade Center. This is the one the skeptics point to, saying it seems hard to believe a paper passport could survive such a crash when two 110-storey steel frame buildings couldn't. Although this cannot be used as evidence of a cover-up, as it's not totally impossible for it to have been blown out of the plane as it hit the towers, it has, however, raised some serious questions that haven't been answered. But why would a passport be planted there? The theory is that the terrorists were framed and were hired and set up by the US government and are still alive. This was strengthened when Mohammed Atta's father said he spoke to his son the day after the attack and said he was fine. It sounds insane, but his father was also interviewed and stated his son's passport was stolen and he is either hiding or being kidnapped by the FBI. He goes on to say his son hated Osama bin Laden and would never take part in the terrorist act. A man who also knew him and lived next to his family's home in Egypt said he did not believe Atta was responsible. Either they're in complete denial or they are both telling the truth. As a matter of fact, every single person who is thought to have been responsible have apparently come forward to say they were framed. Although, since we have no interviews or official statements of this, we can only speculate. Another thing people say raises suspicion is that despite questioning, it doesn't seem any information has been released, such as the section of their boarding pass that would have been torn off at the airport, or credible CCTV footage supporting the theory that the hijackers didn't even board the planes. Now you could say, why should the FBI release this information, and they probably shouldn't, but when there's such a huge amount of doubt about 9-11, you would think they would to prove people wrong. Yet despite many asking for evidence, nothing credible has been given. Does this prove the terrorists were framed and are hiding or being kidnapped? Absolutely not, but it's things like this the skeptics point to when saying we haven't been told the full story. Then there are the planes. It's said that during the hijacking of all the flights, passengers on board rang family members to tell them what was happening. Scientists maintain that mobile phones would not have been possible at the altitude the planes were flying at. Others argue, however, that not all the calls were from cell phones, but also from the phones in the back of the plane's seats, and that cell phones can work whilst on an aeroplane at low altitude, which is when the calls were made. Because of this, the theory that the calls were not actually made or were made with voice morphing technology has been dismissed by most. Add the fact that a large amount of passengers on board the flights made last minute plans to get on those planes, and also Linda Gronlud who rang her young sister from Flight 93 to tell her she loved her and gave her the combination to a safe that only she would know, and the voice morphing conspiracy has very little credible information to back it. 
But what about the plane's black boxes, which are electronic recording devices with the sole purpose of helping gather information in the event of an aviation disaster? The black boxes from the plane that hit the Pentagon and the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania were recovered, but they were so badly damaged that not all the information could be retrieved. The planes that hit the World Trade Center, however, were never found. But two firefighters say that three of four boxes were recovered at Ground Zero, and FBI agents took them away and told them not to mention anything. But how could a passport survive the initial impact, which we can assume was on the person at the front of the plane, yet the black boxes, which are situated at the back of the plane and are designed to withstand a crash, could not? Before I talk about the collapse of the two World Trade Centers and Building 7, which both make up the bulk of Skeptic's arguments, I want to discuss some of the conspiracies surrounding the Pentagon. When you consider the devastation a commercial aircraft caused to the World Trade Centers, by comparison, the Pentagon crash did not appear to have caused so much damage, which has raised questions. Pictures that emerged from the crash show much smaller impact holes on the building than you would expect from a plane with a width of around 125 feet. But it has been said that the plane crashed into a part of the building that had recently been renovated and was incredibly reinforced. But why has only one video of the Pentagon being hit been released? It said it was caught on 82 different cameras, yet these have never been released to prove the skeptics wrong and take the doubt out of people's minds. Add the fact that no bodies, seat wreckage or luggage was apparently found has also fueled the skeptics. They say apart from a few pieces of aeroplane, they see no solid proof that Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. April Gallup, a Pentagon worker, also backs these claims, saying whatever hit the building she was in did not look like a plane. But what about all the witnesses who did see the plane crash? These conspiracy theories about, I don't know, the Navy sent missiles and, I mean, first they don't make logical sense, like, where did the plane go after that and why are those people dead? But uh, I saw it, there's, there's just no question at all that the plane went into the Pentagon wall. What I saw was a jumbo jet hit the Pentagon. The end. You know, bottom line is, I saw the plane hit. It hit the building. The conspiracy theorists believe if the plane was traveling at 530 miles per hour, which is stated in the 9-11 Commission report, it would have been a blur and no one would have had a chance to even see the plane. So if it wasn't a plane like some suggest, then what was it? The most believed alternate theory is that it was a missile and Flight 77 was taken elsewhere to be taken care of. This thought has angered the family of the passengers on board the flight, but many do continue to believe this is what happened. When the two World Trade Center buildings collapsed, the world was in complete shock. Two 110-story buildings came crashing vertically down in what seemed like a controlled manner. This led to people saying the towers fell due to a demolition and not as a result of the plane crash and subsequent fire that melted and weakened the steel beams. After all, there's only been three high-rise buildings that have ever collapsed due to fire like on 9-11, and that is World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7 on September the 11th, 2001. The scientific evidence suggests that aviation fuel and office furniture simply could not produce the sort of heat needed to melt the steel frames of the towers and especially not give off enough heat for the fire at Ground Zero to burn for nearly four months, being completely soaked in water. So what do the conspiracy theorists believe? They believe the towers must have been assisted in their collapse by explosives, more specifically thermite or nanothermite, which is believed to have been present in the dust at Ground Zero. But if the skeptics are right, then how could anyone plant the sufficient amount of explosives into the buildings ahead of time without raising suspicion? Ben Fountain, who worked on the 47th floor of the South Tower, said the government knew the buildings were a target and over the past few weeks, people had been evacuated a number of times, which was unusual. Although he believes this was simply a safety protocol, as they had an inkling that something was going to happen, people say the evacuation would have given enough time to plant explosives in areas where workers may spot them if they had not been evacuated. But what is the official story? The official story is that the fires at both World Trade Centers 1 and 2 caused support trusses of the buildings to weaken and the weight of the top floors pile drive down, causing the tower's collapse. However, each tower is designed to survive the impact and fire from a collision by an airliner carrying 23,000 gallons of fuel. The planes that hit the towers were each carrying just 10,000 gallons of fuel. 
So if like the official story states, the buildings came down by the plane's impact and following fires, how does this explain both towers falling in under 10 seconds? This is the same amount of time an object would have taken to hit the ground at the height of the World Trade Centers, meaning both towers fell with virtually no resistance from the perfectly undamaged metal and concrete below the plane's impact points. There doesn't seem to be any answers to that question, apart from the official pile drive theory or the use of explosives. But surely if there were explosives inside the buildings, this would have been seen and heard by many. Well, there are quite a few people on camera saying they heard loud explosions shortly before the towers fell, and thousands of engineers, scientists, and demolition experts have exerted their belief that the towers may have been assisted in their collapse, as they could not have fallen with as much precision as they did from fires. So the question still remains, were the towers assisted in their collapse by planned explosives? And if so, could the demolition team responsible live with themselves, knowing they killed thousands of innocent people? Okay, so all of the above could easily be a coincidence that just seems like there is more to the story, but Building 7 is where things get very mysterious. Building 7 was positioned on the same site as the Twin Towers, and on 9-11, after the towers had fallen, Building 7 unexpectedly collapsed seven and a half hours later. The building was not hit by a plane and only had minimal damage from falling debris. It did, however, have a fire inside the building, and this is what the official statement said brought this building down. But on the day of the attack, something else strange happened. A BBC News correspondent reported the collapse of World Trade Center 7 20 minutes before it happened. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that, there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Now, it's not sure if this was just a mess up with communication, which is understandable with all the chaos going on, or that its destruction was planned ahead of time and they messed up the schedule. But then an interview of Larry Silverstein was released in 2002 of him saying we decided to pull Building 7. This isn't a theory, this isn't just word of mouth or speculation, this is an actual video of Larry, the owner of the World Trade Centers, saying that firefighters decided to pull Building 7. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. Now, the word pull in demolition terminology means to set off the explosions that will bring the building down. If this was the case with Building 7, then how was the building fitted with explosives and brought down, in an operation that takes weeks, if not months, just a few hours after the Twin Towers were hit? Surely everyone would be more focused on helping victims than thinking about bringing down Building 7. Now, the official 9-11 Commission states that Building 7 was damaged from falling debris and came down due to fire weakening just one column. If this is true, then what is Larry talking about? I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. But this isn't the only conspiracy surrounding Larry Silverstein. On July 24th, just two months before the attack, he purchased a $3.2 billion 100-year lease on World Trade Center 1 and 2, and took out insurance policies that covered from terrorism, which paid him around $5 billion after the September attack. Naturally, he has been blamed as having insider information, and that is his reasoning to buy the buildings. After all, the World Trade Centers were filled with huge amounts of now illegal asbestos, and many say they were a bad buy. Granted, by 2001, half of the asbestos had been removed, but it's believed there would have been three options that would eventually had to have been made as the buildings continued to get outdated. The asbestos would have had to be removed and replaced, either while the towers were occupied or not. 
both would have cost millions and millions of dollars. Or the towers could slowly be dismantled and new towers could be built. This is estimated to have cost an unknown amount, far more than the towers were worth. However, if they were destroyed by an act of terror, then the asbestos would be taken care of and a huge insurance claim could be paid, and a plot would be left for new buildings. Larry was also suspiciously not in on the day of the attack, despite being there almost every morning on the run-up to September the 11th. This all sounds very suspicious, but before you blame Larry, when you dig deeper, you will find out that he only got the lease on the World Trade Centers as the original bidder pulled out last minute, and there were over 30 people trying to obtain the building, any of which had just as good a chance as he did. It's also interesting to find out that despite the asbestos, which can instantly sound like Larry was in on it for the insurance money, the World Trade Center buildings were actually a very good buy, hence the 30 plus bidders trying to get a lease. So if you look at it one way, you can see why people say Larry had advanced knowledge of the attack and purchased the buildings to profit from the insurance. Or was he just doing what he does best and buying property in New York? And the insurance was just the fact that the World Trade Centers had been a target for terrorism in the past. After all, would Larry, an already billionaire with more money than he could ever need, really be responsible or in on an attack that killed thousands of people just for a few extra billion in insurance money? It does all seem strange, and you can see why people are pointing at him, but it could just be a coincidence. However, back to Building 7. After Larry's interview and the official verdict on Building 7's collapse, nearly 2,000 architects and structural engineers signed a petition for a new investigation into its destruction, saying buildings simply do not fall down like this due to fire, especially in under 7 seconds and in such a controlled state. To date, no further investigations have taken place, and the official reasoning behind Building 7's destruction has remained the same. Once all is said and done, why on earth would the government have any involvement in the mass killing and destruction that took place on that day? If, like the skeptics believe, it was an inside job, then why? Why would they do this? It's thought Osama bin Laden, who apparently denied any involvement in the attacks, but then appears to have changed his mind in a video that many believe is fake, was set up and was used as a patsy for America to invade Iraq for various reasons, mainly oil. But would they kill innocent people simply to go to war with another country? It sounds obscene, but then people bring up Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods was a 1962 false flag operation to fake a terrorist attack on American civilians and blame it on the Cuban government in order to invade their country. Thankfully, the operation was rejected by the Kennedy administration, but still, the thought that something like this was even contemplated certainly doesn't reassure the 9-11 skeptics. It seems with the information we have, there are a handful of believed scenarios for 9-11. One, it was an entire government cover-up and the terrorists were framed. Two, it was a terrorist attack by Al-Qaeda. However, the government could have tightened up their security and possibly prevented the attack. And perhaps there were explosives in the building, but the government simply could not admit they slipped up so badly by allowing the terrorists to get into the buildings and plant explosives. Or thirdly, the government or other insiders knew it was coming and exaggerated the impact by planting explosives in buildings 1, 2 and 7. Unfortunately, we may never know the full story about what happened, but should never forget the victims and the heartbreak their family and friends have endured since. Although I would love to hear all of your theories in the comments, please be considerate. Thousands of people died, and if you have nothing better to say than just blame people without giving adequate information to back your claims, then simply pay your respect to those involved, instead of fueling an argument. Thank you for watching, and once again, my heart goes out to all of those whose lives were affected by this tragic event.